I think the biggest difference between account-based and traditional selling is that traditional sellers look to go after people, VPs of sales at XYZ or v, you know, directors of marketing. or uh, they, they start with that title versus account-based sellers start with the company. Hello, Sales Nation. I am Will Byron, host of the Salesman Podcast, and welcome to another episode. On today's show, we have Kyle Porter, and we're talking about account-based selling. It's something that with hindsight, if I would have done this in the days I worked in medical device sales, and I was doing half of it already, but if I'd had more of a structured approach to it, it, it would have genuinely added to my success. So it was interesting to dive into that with Kyle. Kyle is the co-founder of Sales Loft, a online platform that can increase your qualified demos and appointments by over 300%. Find out more about Kyle and everything he's doing over there at salesloft.com. If you enjoy the show, it would mean the world to me and and to you guys as well in a weird paradoxical way if you could leave a itunes review if you listen to this on an ios device there is a quick super easy 30 second uh, to a minute tops guide to follow to do that over at salesman.red forward slash review and essentially more reviews higher up the itunes charts more downloads and bigger guests so the show ends up being better for you guys and so I, and i appreciate of course the reviews they help us grow and accelerate our growth. So with all that said, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, Kyle, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome, sir. So today we're going to talk about account-based sales. It's something that I've done elements of in my medical device sales days, but I didn't have a way to structure it or call it or uh, use you know, to define it in, in that manner. And so it was just trial and error that I got to the bottom of some of the things that we're going to talk about. Uh, so I guess to start things off and to put everything in perspective, do you have a definition of account-based sales that you can share with us? Yeah, you know, it's pretty simple. And I think you kind of you kind of tipped on it that it's been around. It's not anything that's absolutely new. You know, salespeople have had territories. They've had named account lists. Uh, they've had target accounts. And it's really... Uh, what we're seeing with the modern selling approach to account based is that it's not just the sales function, but it's sales development. It's some of the marketing things. It's really an all encompassing approach to going after a list of targeted accounts that fit your ideal customer profile. And uh, the fortunate circumstance is that today's technology allows us to be more defined over the right type of company that we have that we want to go after. And it allows us to be better, uh, have a better process and workflow uh, to initiate engagements through communication to uh, to reach those folks at those companies. And so I think that's what account base means, is it's taking a target list and doing all the things necessary to convert that ideal customer profile into qualified pipeline. And to add a bit of context in the bigger picture, is this for salespeople? Is this for sales and marketing? Is this for sales marketing and sales ops and all these other crazy names and terms that keep uh, popping up in 2016. Yeah, it's de it's for departments that are responsible for acquiring new customers. I want to get really practical with all this because it's one thing to have the high level conversation. For the salesperson listening, perhaps, and this has been my experience, I've never had any help from a marketing department. The prospecting, the, the relationship building, the closing, the follow-up, all that stuff has been done on a territory in my medical medical device sales days, uh, essentially by myself with support yep. from sales management, that kind of thing. Um, so I want to, well, first off, is an account-based methodology and, and process, is that applicable to an individual salesperson as well as the more classic examples, I guess, from your perspective are tech companies that have all this uh, extra stuff added in as well? You know, it's not as representative of what we mean when we say account-based selling today, uh, but it is still account-based sales approach. It's just that that person is a full cycle rep taking on all the responsibilities to do the things that multiple different departments or functions would do in a more mature organization or in a, in a different type of sales environment. There's still mature and, and aggressive growth uh, sales organizations where the, uh, the AE or the, the salesperson uh, you know, controls a lot of the process, but for more high velocity selling environments, uh, for faster growth companies, uh, for more modern approaches, uh, you see it broken into more specialization throughout multiple people inside of an organization doing different functions in this account-based sales process. 
Cool. Because I guess if everyone has their own specialist niche within the business, that they're just better at it and they're going to be high performing in, in those contexts, right? Yeah, that's the idea. You know, um, it's the whole idea that that bred about the sales development movement, which quite frankly is the the biggest innovation that happened to selling in the last decade is that if you take people who are highly specialized at making first contact with potential buyers and you have them train and research and, and excel at that one task of taking a new, a net new name and turning it into qualified pipeline opportunity. And then you have another team that's entirely focused on taking pipeline opportunities and turning them into close one business. Then you can get more efficiencies of scale uh, when you, you know, really drive in and become specialist in those roles. And how does this work from the customer's side? So, and again, I've only ever worked in medical device companies that have never done this. It's been a, a territory-based dude or lady on the floor knocking on surgeons' doors and spending time yep. in theatre. So, um, and, and I think a lot of the audience as well, uh, not not perhaps based in tech companies, although there is some people in the audience in that perspective. So, how does this work for the customer's perspective when they get a phone call from one person passed on to another person? I'm just intrigued as the the process here. Do they, because uh, obviously you can't lie and say that the person who's going to be closing them at the end is the person who's calling them at the beginning. That's right. Do they, are they bothered by this step-by-step -step process? How does, how does it play out with them? Well, you know, what you're hitting on is, is probably one of the most common fears of executives when adopting a sales development approach or a multi, uh, hmm. you know, specialist sales approach. But the thing is, is that those folks aren't experts at that stage. So what becomes super important is the, the handoff, or what some folks say, passing the baton. And the whole idea here is that if you go to uh, a, a doctor because you have um, you know, a headache, and, uh, and then he can't diagnose it completely, he's going to recommend you to a specialist that is more equipped to handle that type of situation that you're faced with. And so it's the same thing in selling. When, when uh, great sales development reps are approaching prospects, they're extremely equipped at uncovering a kind of a vast landscape of opportunities and honing those down to, is this right for, for your business and helping you know, is it high level? Is it, is, it, is it something that might fit my objectives in the company? And then a sales specialist might be better at navigating the landscape of helping you understand it more fully. It's just why it's the same reason why in technology they have sales engineers, right? The salesperson isn't the one that does all the technical deep dive and shows the integration. They're the specialist at that. And so the way that I've seen it most aptly handled is for the rep to tell you, Will, hey, I'm glad we got to connect. And it sounds like that you've been able to understand that there might be an opportunity for your business. I'd like to promote you to an expert in this area who can do a better job of deep diving on the exact situation that you have and helping you uncover whether or not all the, the pieces will fit in place to solve your problem and help you achieve the things you're looking to do. And so we look at it as more of a promotion in the process than uh, you know, just, hey, I'm gonna send you over to Bob because I gotta go back and make some more phone calls. So I think that little tweak seems to, to do well to kind of uh, you know, navigate that, that, uh, ch that, that important conversation. Sure, okay, I, let's get really practical with this, Kyle, from the perspective of, it seems that, that okay, I, I, I totally get what you're saying of the split between individuals doing the, this across the sales process more efficient, but it seems like it can be translated to one person as well if it needs to be depending on the circumstances and the situation. Is there a, and we'll break it down because I'm sure the answer is yes. Is there a step-by-step -step process for uh, account selling versus, and, and is it different to the traditional sales process that we're all very well versed with? I think the biggest difference between account-based and traditional selling is that traditional sellers look to go after people, VPs of sales at XYZ or v, you know, directors of marketing, or uh, they, they start with that title versus account-based sellers start with the company. I want to go sell to pharmaceutical businesses between these ranges of revenue who have this technology struggle or challenge or problem. And then once we get in, we'll navigate the landscape of who are the five people we need to reach out to at that company. And so it's just, the, it's just a small tweak. And a lot of companies have been doing this for a long time. Uh, so that's step one is identify the target accounts. Step two is identify the personas of the people that you want to reach out to at that company. Step three is identify the types of mediums that you want to reach out with. It could be send a handwritten note, leave a LinkedIn message, 
make three phone calls, send four emails, uh, make some phone calls where you don't leave a voicemail, some co phone calls where you do leave a voicemail, meet them at a conference. There's all kinds of things you can do uh, as the medium of engagement, but, but drafting that out and creating a cadence of touch points is ideal. And then also, a lot of sophisticated companies are taking different people inside their organization and assigning them to tasks. So for example, one of my customers, their sales development team will reach out to marketing team leads and marketing managers, but then whenever they get a marketing VP on, they'll have their VP reach out to that VP. And then when they want someone to reach out to the CEO, they'll have their CEO reach out to the CEO. So as a CEO of an 80-person company with uh, 35 sellers at the company, I may have 10 tasks a week to reach out to CEOs of companies that they're trying to prospect into. And, I'm, and it's a coordinated task for me that's part of the account-based sales process for them. And I'm, I'm a piece of that puzzle. So I think uh, to recap, it's identify the accounts, identify the personas of people at those accounts, identify the mediums of which you want to reach them, design a cadence of touch points, and then incorporate other people in your company uh, to reach out to other folks at their company if the situation allows for it. And how do you suss out the medium and then the cadence obviously follows on from that? Is this purely number crunching that the, the best rep has done this, this, and this? So we'll test this process, uh, you know, we'll try it with other people and then narrow it down and, and keep, continue to focus and refine it. Yeah, you're, you're kind of hitting on the, uh, the opportunity for shameless self-promotion of our product because, you know, we really design a system that allows you to make those touch points to your prospects and set up the cadence for how many emails, how many voicemails, how many phone calls, how many social touch points, LinkedIn, Twitter, and then program them all in. And so now what happens is, and there's other apps that do this as well, so it's not just SalesLoft, but you can have a system that holds you accountable to these touch points, and then it measures it for success and spits back out better answers. So, oh, you need to send less email and make more phone calls, or you need to use these type of templates, or you need to go with these value propositions, or you need to make sure you use LinkedIn. And that once you initiate uh, a touch point cadence, the next thing to do is measure it for success and then improve based on the results that you get. And so it's a constant game of iteration. And what's happening when you say measure for success, clearly we're not, <laughs> you're not going to share your algorithms or anything else that's going on in the background and no one would understand it listening to the show anyway. But what, what's going on in layman's terms when you say that? Well, the companies are setting up a success goal. So they're saying on the top of the funnel, I want to take prospects who have never heard about us before or that we've never spoken to and I want to convert them into pipeline opportunities and the success is the pipeline is the conversion to an op and so now what we do is we look at which activities led to which successes and which activities were most successful with those successes and then you can have like uh, steps that lead up to them like for example opening of emails answering of phone calls replying of emails, clicking on links, uh, kind of positive momentum indicators. And, and then you measure the, uh, the actions you took to get those indicators and then improve upon those things. So I'm really intrigued here. And this question tends to split guests that we have on the show, probably 50-50. How much of sales is refining the process and it being in the numbers in that you know how many people go in the funnel, how many are you gonna get out once you've got this efficient sales process in place? How much of it is that and how much of it is the soft skills of being able to build relationships, being able to close, your confidence, your mindset and that side of things? Yeah, so the higher the velocity of sale required for success, the more scientific the process is. So for example, if you have representatives at your company closing 100 deals each per month, then science is a big factor in that how you tee up the right conversations, making sure that you spend the right time with the right prospects, making sure that you ask the tried and true questions, making sure you send over the order form in the same way each time. You've got to do things a lot more uh, mathematically when you've got to close 100 deals a month. Now, if you've got to close one deal a month, then you can let the art and, uh, and creativity take a bigger role there. So you'll see if you're selling Boeing jets, for example, you may sell like one new customer per year and you don't have to follow you know, sort, too much regiment on mm. your outreach process or your communication process. So I think it all depends on you, the sales. Would you be able to close two sales a year if you narrowed down to that? You made an interesting yeah. uh, kind of 
the, the sentence that you put forward then of the velocity of things, because surely all of us want to sell more products, have more customers, or is what you is what you are you saying that there's a trade off perhaps between um, velocity versus yeah. the quality? That's right. High velocity sales tactics aren't as effective in a Boeing jet cell because they require more investment, empathy, and time focus on those small amount of specific prospects. Mm. So, uh, you know, cold email uh, c communication is not necessarily going to be effective in selling a jet. Uh, you have to take them out to uh, fancy shows and dinner, and maybe <laughs> more, you know. And so, I, I think I think what one thing that that people don't you know talk a lot about is that. Uh, you can get a lot of things done if you have the sales skills, and then you can accelerate them dramatically if you have the right science. Um, but if you only have the science and not the sales skills, you can't get a lot done. So I think if there's one that's a must-have is kind of knowing the art of the deal, I think, is, is critically important. But once you know it, the, um, you know, the lever or the force multiplier is how repeatable, predictable, mm -hmm. and scalable you can make that process. Okay, well, we'll come on to Sales Loft at the end of the show. But for anyone who is listening and goes, yes, repeatable, scalable, all sounds great to me as an individual salesperson, what data can they collect that they can make judgments on? Is this, is it as simple as what a marketer would do of open rates, number of replies to emails? Because I guess that's first fine for the first step. But then what should you be collecting on after that? Really look at who is your ideal customer profile by really stereotyping the customers you have today and maybe uh, 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 appending that to the goals of tomorrow. So for example, we may have uh, 100, you know, 1,000 customers and we may have some goals to uh, double the average size customer in the next 12 months. And so under that philosophy, I'd look at uh, companies that are similar to the ones that we've closed but may have double the pipeline opportunity. You may, may have double the size in terms of users or, or potential. Um, and so those are some examples. I think, I think you want to get some data around who's the ideal customer at first. Then you want to get actual data, contact information, phone number, email address, that sort of thing, titles. Um, and then you want to get data on, like you said, activities and the success of those activities. So we've done some an interesting analysis. I analyzed um, a half million phone calls made using our platform in February. And half of those phone calls were made uh, from the area code of the seller and the other half were made where the buyer sees their own area code in the caller ID. So the, the seller was using the buyer's area code. It's a thing called local presence or local dial. Mm -hmm. And in non-local dial uh, phone calls, there was an 11% call to connect rate on all those 250,000 calls that went out. On the local dial, there was a 17% call to connect rate. So a gigantic improvement when you call from the area code of the potential buyer. That's one example. Another example would be we analyzed millions and millions of emails that were sent from salespeople. And we identified that when they sent templated emails, templated emails will say, hey, first name, I understand you're at company name. I'd like to talk to you in uh, two business days from today. You know, hashtag two business days from today would replaces with Tuesday. Yeah. Um, that's a templated email. And then a personalized email is where the template is changed to accommodate a personalization. Like, hey, Will, I was watching your podcast, and you talked about X, Y, and Z. I think as, a, as an objective of yours, I might be able to help because we're able to help companies that do this as well. We saw that templated emails got a 3% reply rate, and personalized emails got an 8% reply rate. So there's some more data on some of the things that you can do and some of the things that you can improve on. Um, but now you want to look at how many companies did you have to reach out to in order to get a conversion? Because, Will, if, 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 if I take 1,000 companies, if I have to call on 1,000 companies to get 20 deals, and you can th call on 100 companies to get 20 of the same deals, you're a better seller than me. And you're more repeatable. You're more predictable. You cost less money. You're what we want to base the organization on, not me. So I got a low hit rate. You got a high hit rate. And we want to measure that. That's the success and factor. Have you seen that that's a, a shift that's happening in sales over the past few years of um, uh, other sales automation tools that are not not so much with what you're doing, but there are tools out there that are encouraging salespeople to send more marketing templated 
spammy emails just to get more out there. They're allowing them to do it. And, and, and what they're doing wrong is they're not allowing them to do it in a personalized way. Mm. And so what we want to do and what the best sellers want to do is they want to send more emails, period. That's the truth. They want to send more emails to the right people, but they want them more targeted. They want them more specific. They want them more personalized. And they want them to make sense for the buyer so that when the buyer opens that email, they look at it and say, wow, a human sent this that understands me, not a robot. Are salespeople too, and I've done this before many times, are they too quick to email contact uh, and not do, the, not do their due diligence as to whether that person is the right person to be contacting? They're always too quick to email <laughs> over a phone call. Because you can't get rejected in email, man. I mean, you make yeah. a phone call and you could get rejected immediately. And that hurts. It's hard. Uh, so, you know, sellers who sell on the phone every day, they deserve a lot of respect because it's not easy. You know, uh, more, way more times than not, you're going to get straight up rejected. And that's hard. And so people gravitate towards email. But study after study, and you said you had Craig Rosenberg on here. He's run analysis where when you combine email with phone, it's way more effective than either of them on their own. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, the phone is a thing and uh, the best sellers in the world are amazing at it. Good stuff. They have to overcome when, when CEOs answer the phone and say, Hey, thanks for your call. Send me an email. You caught me in the middle of something. Mm. The, the stock reply that they've just done for hundreds of times for the past few weeks. That's right. Cal, I've got a couple of questions to ask everyone that comes on the show. So I want to wrap up with these before you tell us a little bit more about sales loft. First one, I'm going to throw at you. Who is the world's greatest salesperson? Jesus Christ. Why? Because he had no support and now his ideas are being practiced by a large percentage of the world's population. Sales is all about a fundamental belief in yourself and your product and your company. And then all sales is, is transference of that belief. Okay, next one. What is one book or resource other than your own that you'd recommend to the podcast audience? Uh, Trish Bertuzzi's The Sales Development Playbook is fantastic. It's, uh, it's really a step-by-step -step guide for both individual contributors as well as leaders. It's the best book ever written on sales development. Nice. Okay. Until I write mine, Trish, I'm coming after you. <laughs> what motivates you personally to close more deals? And I'm not, I'm not talking about making customers happy. Let's get a couple of layers beneath that. Yeah, um, I think it is uh, an understanding that, that there are gifts that have been given and those gifts need to be fully utilized and put to work. What's your gift then, if that's, if that's the, the angle? Well, I think, you know, I think everybody has been given a, a set of gifts and, and it's their job to take those gifts and put them to the, the best work that they possibly can. And, and I know for a fact that you know, I have uh, specific talents in and around sales and persuasion and business. And, uh, you know, it's my charter to do the most that I can with those. Cool. Okay. And final one. And they ask this, everyone who comes on the show, Craig, give a, a really good answer to this, which I'll, I'll share with you later if you're interested. If you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at sales? <laughs> um, it's it's got to be uh, diving super deep into the empathy piece and really, really understanding what these people are going through, what challenges they're facing every day, what, what their objectives from their boss, from their wife, from themselves, what are they trying to accomplish, what are the roadblocks, really, really, truly understanding what it takes for them to change their organization and change their life, and then be able to come in and provide the solutions that do that. You know, I think uh, a lot of times in sales, people are worried about being a pushy salesperson, and they think asking questions is, is, is being a pushy salesperson. Uh, but it's actually the opposite. The pushy salesperson is the one who doesn't diagnose first and gives a prescription. They're the ones that come in and say, Will, I've got this thing. It's absolutely amazing. It's going to do X, Y, and Z. You're going to love it. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. Everybody's getting a lot of value from it. We've won this award. We've won that award. That's the pushy salesman. That's the wrong salesman. The right salesman is the one who comes in and says, Will, tell me what you're trying to accomplish with regards to your revenue objectives for the next six months. Ah, okay. Who else is, is working with you on that project? Mm. And what have you tried so far? Aha, mm. tell me more about that, right? It's peeling back the onion with real true questions that dive deep into the objective so that I can uncover the keys to your kingdom of the things you're trying to solve. And if there's alignment with what I do as a business 
And if my solution can fit that need, then it's just an, it's just an easy trans, transaction to, to showcase that for you, how you can then solve your problems because I understand them. Good man, good man. Kyle, tell us a little bit about Sales Loft and uh, where we can find out more about you as well. Yeah, just, you know, I'm not going to harp on it much. Sales Loft is software. Uh, it's the simplest way on the internet to convert your prospects into qualified pipeline. So whether you're getting inbound leads or whether you're going and, and doing outbound prospecting, Sales Loft is the system you use to, to process your phone calls, your emails, your social touch points, to lay out the, the cadence and calendaring of which ones you're going to do at which times, and then deploy it to either yourself as a seller or your sales team. And then they stay accountable to the process by clicking buttons, following process, and it gives them more time to be creative, to engage deeply, to research and understand their prospect and sell with more sincerity. Kyle, with that, mate, I want to thank you for your time and your insights. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Awesome, Will. Thank you. Have a great day. And there we have it. Thank you, Kyle, for coming on the show. I appreciate your time and your insights. I think we're going to hear more and more about this account-based selling model, this split of roles from the salesperson who does everything, which is essentially me selling the ad space on the podcast, to separate roles for lead gen, uh, the SDRs, the appointment booking, the closers, the account managers that perhaps follow up afterwards. And I'm interested to see how this and if it changes the world of sales. Of course, it's a world that we're all wrapped up in. And with that, I'll speak with you all again tomorrow.